Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you for attending our webinar today. First, I would like to introduce ourselves and our center. I am Ismahan Arslan Ari. I am an assistant professor of learning design and technologies at the College of Education. I am also the director of the South Carolina Center for Assistive Technology and Educational Research. Today, um, I will present with my colleague, Dr. David Dawson. And Dr. Dawson is a clinical associate professor at the School of Medicine, and he is also the co-director of the South Carolina Center for Assistive Technology and Education Research. Um, he has more than 20 years of experience uh, in working with people with disabilities. Um, and I also had, had my, received my master's degree in special education uh, with the emphasis on visual impairment. And I completed my doctorate in the education technology program at Texas Tech University. Um, before starting to our webinar, I would like to give you a brief information about our center and our current multi-user lab. And the South Carolina Center for Assistive Technology and Education Research is a collaborative interdisciplinary environment of faculty, professionals, and persons with disabilities uh, working together to enhance the life of students uh, with disabilities in the area of school and transition to work. And um, we are an interdisciplinary uh, center. Uh, I am from the College of Education and Dr. Dawson is from the School of Medicine and we have another collaborator from the College of Engineering, Dr. Neshet Hikmet. And we are located at the campus. We are at the Child Development Research Center building. It is 1532 Wheat Street. And uh, with the collaboration, uh, with the, with the collaboration of the Child Development Research Center, we, we established the students with disabilities in STEM multi-user lab for research, training, and outreach this year. And in this lab, we have cutting-edge technologies such as the virtual realities, robots, uh, and we undertake critical research on and provide impact, impactful training, outreach, and support for students with disabilities in STEM field. And we use assistive technologies to support these students. Mm -hmm. And we will be happy to collaborate if you, you or your students need any support. Um, and we are trying to increase the, you know, the number of um, uh, people with disabilities in the STEM field. They, we want to encourage their, you know, to enhance their motivation in the STEM field. And today we are going to present how to work with students who are blind or visually impaired. And uh, I am going to give the floor to Dr. David Dawson. Uh, and Do Dr. Dawson, now it, the floor is yours, so you can give some information about your background. I did not give so much information about you. I want you to give information, then we can start. Okay. Thank you. And again, I have some experience with, again, I'm with School of Education. I've been working in assistive technology for a long time. I'm really excited, uh, Dr. Ari, to have this chance to work in this center. If you get a chance, come visit us again, uh, work with us. We've had a number of students who are uh, train, training in it, and it's just a fun place, so. <laughs> I'm better with the presentation. All right. What we're going to talk about is vision. OK, vision is one of the things where when faculty get this or TAs get this, how do I work with a student who has uh, different types of vision issues, whether uh, blind, low vision and what does it really mean? And this is something that we have experiences. We worked with them I, uh, for the last 30 years. My area of expertise is rehabilitation and rehabilitation sciences and education. And for that reason, we uh, have a number of students who are of visual disabilities come in. I also work in, as uh, Dr. Islam already said, with uh, STEM and so youth on that, and we do a lot there. Um, some things, first off, it's just kind of talking about what it is, just really quickly before we get into it, is the functional blindness is when persons think about vision, they think of functional blindness, where someone really cannot see anything. And that is um, the blindness right there, but 
it's a small group of people it, it, with the percentage. The more uh, larger group will be the second one where we have legal blindness and low vision. And legal blindness definitely is uh, about 2200. So imagine basically again, if seen with your best eye that when you're looking at something looks like 200 uh, feet away and low vision is basically described for anything that causes an impairment with vision and that really is anything that causes uh, their so next one. Right, next slide. All right, so what I want to just do is real quick, and by the way, you can ask questions, type questions in. Uh, I'm really good at answering on the fly, but want to give an idea. When per, a student comes to you and says they have a visual disability, all right, without asking, we're really not sure what that visual do, what are they see, it's really hard. This right here is obviously a picture of normal, right there, a picture of a screen, next one. If you have a person coming in with diabetes, this is what they may be seeing, okay? Um, depending on the diabetes, it may be blurred. They may have uh, splotches right there. So when we're reading, seeing things, they may have to have more accommodations. Things may have to be a little bit larger. Next one. For persons who have glaucoma, glaucoma is not just for persons who are older. We see this also with persons with different types of, again, uh, medications, different types of disorders, or anything in which you basically see the peripheral narrowing. All right. And so a person may uh, tell you they have something like that where they have a peripheral issue. And the way I have my students go when we're in class and we're talking about it is I have them try to look through their uh, hand and squeeze their hand really tight and make it really large first and then keep squeezing it. And I say that's what happens when you only have central vision. And so how do we make the accommodations on that one? Next one. Cataracts is again not just for persons who are older. We're seeing younger people with cataracts. We're seeing a uh, number of reasons uh, that is coming at an earlier age. Cataracts are people will talk about easily removed, not always. So if someone has cataracts, then it's going to be um, like a filter. There's a number of different types of cataracts right there, but this one right here you can see it's not very, but it can be very blurry, and the as it increases. Is significantly worse. One of the things that you have problem, a uh, person who has cataracts is going to have problems with uh, different types of lights. They're going to have problems with different types of contrast. Um, and so we want to have contrast. They may have problems with depth perception. Okay, next one. Macular degeneration is also something that we've been seeing uh, increase of. And that's uh, basically the macular. And the macular, the way that it normally uh, finds right there, even though it's older right there, uh, vision becomes distorted. And what happens in the eye is uh, the way we do it is usually someone, we have them take a look at a straight line. And if they see a bow in the line, that's a really good indication for us when we have a screen test that we put up there. Uh, macular degeneration causes, again, kind of the warping of the field. And also, at, as you can tell, the center of it right there as it uh, progresses. Next one. Retinitis pigmentosa, again, this is a hereditary disease that um, I've had a number of students who had this right here. Again, you'll see the difference from peripheral. This is where they have uh, the peripheral they're losing. They have their central vision right there, but you see also how it's kind of uh, scattered right there. And so uh, definitely we see the problems with this one uh, depending on light, light is depending on settings. Next one. Stroke is another one in which can affect anyone. Stroke and traumatic brain injury. Uh, persons uh, in college age group are have some of the highest for having traumatic brain injury, concussion. And so this is an example of when someone has a traumatic brain injury or a stroke that's working on the uh, big ocular uh, part of the brain. And so a person, this would, a person would have the, uh, this right here where they'd have the half vision, not just in one eye, but both eyes. Okay. And this is a fascinating one because it's half eyes there, both eyes. It can be like a checkerboard. Um, so 
that the, the thing on it is one of the things that you really don't know when you're, you're working with a person with disabilities, one of the things I always like to do is ask, what do you see? What can you see? All right, what can you see on that? What accommodations you need? And that really kind of helps me uh, with really how I'm going to set up classes, helps me with how I'm going to set up labs. So it could be possible adjusting certain lightings. We have uh, persons come in and they may have problems with certain type of overhead lightings. And so we may have a little bit more different type of lighting system coming in. Uh, contrasting colors, especially if I know I have persons right there with low vision, depth perception, I want to make sure that I have uh, ways in which they can see certain contrasts, certain colors when things are uh, steps. Um, magnification equipment. Magnification equipment persons may come in and bring, but you may also need magnification equipment uh, in your labs. And magnification equipment we're going to talk a little bit about there can be anything from just a regular magnifying glass to um, I have holders right there where they actually can fit in there. Um, they can be any of the two of a large CCTVs we'll talk about. Adaptive equipment. Uh, ahead of time, if you know you have someone come in. Again, I always talk about doing it before you can, but making sure that your equipment's already adaptive, not just for persons who are visual disability, but um, persons basically any person having thermometers that could basically read things out loud, having uh, systems right there with metrics where you can they can actually feel it as well as see it, having uh, different things of very audio. Um, Large print uh, accommodation. Go ahead. Oh, go back one more time. Um, again, large print. Make sure that also Braille. Uh, again, how the person. T what is their choice? Um, if we're going to hand out something, we're going to give something. Something we don't have up ahead of time. It's better to have things right up ahead of time for them, but. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes we find the wonderful article in the moment. All right. We want to present it though to them in the form that they get when we present it all others. All right, closed circuit television I already talked about. It's like a big magnifying glass and then audio. Next one, please. OK, um, when we come to the accommodations, um, we also need to you know, pay attention to accommodations on the campus. And here are a few of the examples of the accommodations. First, uh, you should provide access to your PowerPoints or, hand or handouts or uh, whichever you use in your classrooms in advance of the class. And uh, this will help the students with this, you know, the visual impairments to, you know, the, to, read, to read it or to request the, you know, the accommodations before the class. And if requested by the students, course materials should be provided in an accessible electronic format. It can be the Braille or tactile graphics. And if, especially if you are teaching in STEM, math, science, um, the you know the if you are using the simulations and uh, some of the materials, they need tactile you know the, the tools to understand anything. So you need to provide those you know, the tools and, you know, the accessible format of the, you know, the your course materials to those students. Um, and the, the visual impaired students, uh, it is hard for them to take the notes. So you should allow the students to audio record your classes. And they also prefer to use the laptops to take notes. And some of the instructors, they don't want their students to use the laptops in the classroom because they think that it distracts them or you know they don't listen to the classroom they do other stuff in on, on the computer but for those students with visual impairments it is really important for them to use their laptops to take their notes or their ipads whatever they feel comfortable and in the classroom setting you should also make sure that your students was able to sit in their preferred settings um, for example most of them might prefer to sit in the front uh, desks because they want to close to the teacher to hear them better or if they have low vision they need to sit the places that they can easily see the you know the screen 
if you are presenting the PowerPoint or if you are showing something. So you need to work with the students, just you need to check if the students uh, is sitting in their preferred setting and you need to provide the modifications. And National Federations of the Blind also recommend to provide the research materials uh, which should be the accessible in electronic formats. And uh, if you use any uh, research materials like the articles, any research readings, uh, I, we suggest you to check the accessibility and contact with your library to provide the accessible electronic formats to the person with low vision or who are blind. And uh, we talk about providing the digital documents to your students and in this section I will provide the fundamental tips for making these digital documents accessible. It can be in your online courses or it can be in your face-to-face -face courses. And the first one is, you know, as Dr. Dawson mentioned, you should use sufficient contrast color schemes. For example, using light color text on a dark color plain background or you can use dark color text on a light color plain background and um, there are some uh, and low contrast or patterned backgrounds will be inaccessible to the students with low vision that's why you need to uh, consider using the background images so if you use it please make sure that it doesn't distract the readability of your text and um, you you can use the color contrast checker to make sure whether your choice is accessible or not and there are two tools one of them is the you know the name is color contrast analyzer free tool and it is free and you can download your computer and you know you can easily check all your documents color contrast and there's also web I am color contrast checker it is an online tool you can easily check it but you know I prefer the first one uh, because you can easily, you know, the select the color you use on your documents uh, to to check the color contrast issues. Um, another one is while creating your word documents, uh, you we suggest you to use the styles for the headings because the screen readers they use the styles while reading the documents just to you know to emphasize that this is a heading. Uh, otherwise, it is really hard for them to distinguish the headings or the you know, the paragraph text. And for PowerPoints, you should use the pre-approved accessible templates. Uh, those are also available in the Microsoft Office website. Or you can use, the, you know, or if you want to use your own, create your own PowerPoints and use the templates built in the Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, we suggest you to use the slide layout while creating your slides. And another important thing is, you know, use an easy to read font face. Sometimes we choose the, you know, the uh, font types, which looks fancy, but those fancy font types might not be accessible to the people with visual impairment. Uh, sans share fonts are the easily readable option. Uh, most of the time, you know, the, we prefer Arial fonts because you know the for online documents uh, and using sun share fonts are especially important for the students who use screen magnifiers uh, if the font is serif then the font will break apart uh, when it is magnified so you want to be sure you use a sans serif font um, and um, limiting the use of font variations is important uh, please do not use lots of bold italics and all capital letters on the same page also limit the number of text font types uh, to three on the same page and lots of font variations make it hard to read uh, and i know sometimes you want to use different font variations to highlight some of the content but we need to consider the, our students with uh, visual impairments while using uh, those variations and also you should not use too small font sizes. Sometimes we try to, you know, to fit all the content on one page, but uh, it is really hard for them, for the students with visual impairments to read the small font sizes. Uh, text font size should be at least 12 points. However, it should be 24 points for your PowerPoints. And, uh, 
uh, provide alternative text with all graphic images and the charts. Uh, students with screen readers rely on this alternative text to get information about your visuals. Uh, while alt text provides what the image is, use image description to provide the details. And mm, please avoid access animation or flashing images. It is really hard for the students with visual impairments to catch those flashing images. Also, it is not accessible with the screen readers. Uh, in your online courses or digital documents, if you provide a link, uh, the, na the name of these links should be descriptive and meaningful. Uh, for example, if benefits, you know, if you use benefits as your hyperlink, it is not accessible because it doesn't describe enough to inform the students benefits of what. So you need to be specific and to use the descriptive names, give descriptive names to your link. Instead, you can use, for example, uh, benefits of online learning. And um, this is, you know, the next one is using avoid some of avoiding some of the link names. Uh, we can see those a lot in the online documents, but those are not accessible. About using click here, email me, or URL text, they don't tell what those students will locate when they follow those links. They start instead, please use the descriptive um, hyperlinks. And uh, before providing your documents to your students, um, you can check the accessibility of your documents. Uh, Microsoft Office uh, has a built-in accessibility checker and uh, to check you just need to click on the file on the top of your menu ribbon then select info and check for issues and check accessibility and on this slide um, I you know I provide the you know the the link how it, how you can access and when you uh, when you select the check accessibility, it provides you an accessibility report and tells you how to fix those issues. And uh, we use PDF in our online courses, right? And especially if you want to provide any research material, the articles, or especially now during the pandemic, most of you are teaching online and we just scan our documents and upload to, our, to the Blackboard or your course website. But when we provide the PDFs, um, those you know the scanned PDFs might not be accessible and treated as an as images. And uh, you need to I suggest you to check the accessibility. Uh, and the PDF Adobe Adobe Acrobat also has the built-in accessibility checker. And um, your to provide the accessible PDF, your PDF should be searchable for the screen readers to read the text. I think this is one of the common issues in the online courses or when we provide you know, the documents from different resources. And if possible, even though we use uh, Word, uh, PDF, PowerPoints, um, the, the HTML is the most accessible file format. If possible uh, use HTML and uh, this is this the, that part that I presented about accessible documents are just you know the basic you know the tips about making your access courses documents accessible but if you want to learn more how to make your online courses accessible we provided we presented the webinar in in March 5th I guess so about it and we have the recording I will be you know the the, the recording is available on YouTube I am going to um, after the webinar I am going to copy and paste the link for that webinar you can watch and learn more about the uh, making the online courses accessible and um, also if you are teaching online or have virtual meeting with your students uh, you should check the accessibility options of your video conference conferencing tools uh, and for example in you know we you we should know if the students can easily navigate in those virtual uh, 
platforms, video conferencing tools, because the Blackboard, we have Blackboard Collaborate, we need to double check if it is accessible. You know, if you don't have, haven't had chance or, you know, if you don't have the software to check the accessibility, maybe you can contact with those students and see if they can easily access to those tools and if they have any problems on uh, using those tools. And uh, also, uh, if you are providing any materials during your meetings, please check the accessibility. And in your virtual meetings, um, uh, if you know if if you are presenting something on your uh, slides, you need to explain everything on the image to the to the students. And you also need to check if your homeworks or the field trips, if you are using the virtual field trips, you know, you need to check if those virtual trips are accessible to those students. Dr. Dawson, would you like to add anything on that part? Yeah, and, and this is where the. We have we can do our best. And there's a, one of the things when you ever get a chance before um, work with a student who has a visual disability and maybe if you go ahead test out the different ones so what an example was collaborate and when adobe collaborate was out they sent a list how it was successful for persons who are blind so uh, i was working with a student who was blind and although the initial what he could see from it couldn't go to the chat room really easy he didn't know when people were posting to the chat room he would have to go out and in and so what happened was we'd have to go and I'd have to let them know and say, OK, I see a new message coming in right here. There are, are sometimes with these different uh, meetings right there, every one of them has pros, every one of them has cons on there. So the best place is the next slide. We actually added some links right here. And so whenever possible, um, go through there, take a look at the accessibility. Student Disability Services is the other group right there. I highly recommend going to our Student Disability Services, talk with them. And uh, the other one is there's a lot of boards. Um, if I don't know something right there and successfully there's a problem, I can quickly really kind of Google it and find out what the work around. Sometime it may be uh, there's a problem with a certain type of screen readers we're going to talk about. So, um, when go ahead, you're right there. Uh, computer access, you got it. <laughs> All right, so I think we covered a lot of this right here. Your your users right there, when they have it, are going to be using a lot of these there different ones, and they may or may not be aware of them. If I'm working with uh, students who have recent uh, visual, uh, basically, again, person can have trauma to the rise at any time. Low vision, contrasting vision, there are so many things that affect right there. And so some of the things that I do a lot of times is also kind of talk. What are they using? What are they not using? And so we, we kind of right there is the idea of helping them um, co contrast screens. Um, if I'm working with them or working with there, I find out I had a individual uh, student of mine who was in uh, one of the labs and he had a acuity in this where he would get massive headaches when he saw the screen because that it was so basically contrast and bright. And we for had to work with him to really take that screen and gray it out. And it took a little bit to find exactly what where we could barely see it and it was just like perfect for him. And so the difference in usually high contrast, we had to do low contrast for him so that he could work with us and work with all the different ones. Um, make sure that again, screen readers right there are available. If you're using basically persons to read things right there, you may have them put headphones in where they're doing screen readers. Although I've also had it where I've gone and made it a user uh, design where I'll say for those who want to basically read. All right, you can read right here for those who want to listen to it and I'll do a screen reader and it'll be open to everyone to read and they can listen to it again different ones, closed captioning for any time I do movies or anything, anything with uh, signs, anything in my building, anything that's needed is rail, uh, rail. And we'll talk about magnification and dictation in a second. All right, next. Students may be using a variety of what we call 
Um, there's difference between text readers and screen readers. A screen reader is something that reads everything on the screen. It basically, for a person who's blind, it's the way that we do kind of that orientation uh, based right there. The most popular ones are JAWS, MVDA. Um, those are the two that are big for persons who are blind. I was just at a CSUN conference on assist technology just a couple weeks ago, and everyone was moving to MVDA, it looked like, and that's a really good platform. I, I, I'm going to try to do a demonstration in a second. Um, talk back window eyes, voiceover. Uh, these are also good for persons who have vision, who have low vision. They can see some things, but not right there. Now, the reason why I'm pointing this out is that persons may be coming to you and if they're going to basically be in your office and you're showing something on the screen, if it's on their laptop, it's sometimes a little awkward. Um, I have on my computer, uh, the ITS has something called uh, MVDA on mine. And so when a person comes in, I need to show some things on the screen. We need to do some things on the screen. I can make it really accessible. The MVDA I love because of that, quite honestly, it's extremely user friendly. So we're going to try it really quick and see if this works. And I'm doing a share, including audio. I'm actually going to do my desktop this time. All right, can you see the visual? And I'm going to pull up uh, my MVDA. Hold on, I think I need to stop my sharing so you can share. Okay. You cannot see, can you share one more time? Dr. Dyson? Yep. And I'm going to share my screen. I'm just going to show the screenshot right there. What do you see? Yes, we can see now. OK, so. I'm going to load up my MVDA and you should be able to hear this one right here, and it's my preference when I'm working with a student. And so I'm loading up. Normal cursor. Most commands for controlling NVDA require you to hold down. Well, welcome to NVDA. All right. So one of the things that you see right there, uh, there is it comes up, it automatically talks right there to me. The reason that I really love this one is a person who is blind, a person uh, who sighted both can use it fairly easily. Um, if you know it right there, I can just simply put my mouse on top of it. Most commands for controlling NVDA require you to hold down the NVDA key while pressing other keys. By well, okay. welcome to NVDA. If I go right here to okay. the slide. Okay, slide two. Visual impairment, slide view. Okay, and so it's kind of giving me the orientation that is showing the slide right there. Title, placeholder, shape, visual impairment. So I basically right there is, if I were using a person who is blind, I'd be using my keys uh, strokes. I would not be using, um, basically right there, I would be using keys instead of the mouse. Text, placeholder, shape, functional blindness. The absence of any usable vision, legal blindness. Visual acuity of 20 slash 200 in the better eye with the best correction or a visual field of no more than 20 degree. Right. So it kind of gives you an idea of it. Nor normal cursor. And so it, if you notice it also. Microsoft team calendar one running window PowerPoint to Dragon Dragon bar Google Chrome. I can again pull text up placeholder shape up. Func untitled Google. All right, I can bring up the university. HS. Give it a moment. Link our edit cursor. OK, so they'll talk about the cursor right there. Then I can basically bring it in again, different ways that which I normal can cursor. All right. And our faculty members help staff the Prisma Health Midlands Medical Group. And if I want to jump, you know, normal and known cursor. Matt, normal cursor. So let me now get out of no, this. Micro, no, run, sit, normal, notify, task bar, notification, op, overflow, no, and no, and known cursor. My yep. school, of, link heading level four, class of 1981. If, norm, NVD, X, what would you like? Alert is, norm, it's, 
All right. So let me go right here and go back to Teams. And let's take me off of this. All right. So again, it, it sounds like there, it takes a little bit to get control, but one of the things that it really allows me access to is that then the student can, I can work with student 101. They can see the screen, I can see the screen, we can see a lot of things, we can see assignments, and it really works really well. All right, next, all right, ready to go. You back to slides. All right. Um, text readers are another one that we've actually covered in another form right there. And what text readers is for persons with low vision and text readers allow basically for a person to highlight uh, any text and have it read to them or the cursor. There are a lot of free ones in uh, Windows Navigator as well as there's a lot of them for Google, Chrome, different ones that we have available. I keep these also on. And the reason that I have them is I also have these in Blackboard. It's not just for my students with dis, uh, who are visual disabilities, but my other students I've found out also like to have things read aloud to them. And sometimes it helps for their own memory. And so we use a text reading software and that's available to them. Next one. Some students will be using screen magnification and this is the one uh, you'll really need to look at. And um, I'm not going to do the demonstration on screen magnification, but I'll talk about it. Uh, the screen magnification, one of the things that you really want to be covered is because there is basically um, when we do magnification, all right. What a person's able to see depends on their sight and depends on their. Um, I had a individual who a uh, colleague of mine and they would actually see and to basically read. They could have they would have to fill up a computer screen and they would only see two letters at a time. And so words were very good going over two letters at a time, which meant, by the way, if any type of painting image or anything, it would also be kind of distorted. So we had to find other ways that the person could see that, and that's usually either having descriptions, some type of description they could read what it is, or we'll talk about having a tactile uh, design that they could feel. I'm talking to you because of that. I have currently on my uh, screen a 50 inch screen and I use 50 inch monitors because that is how I can see is uh, my vision and everything I use is a 50 inch screen. So uh, it's really easy. Right, next one. And zoom text magnifier is a, a really nice one right there. Um, again, student disability services are great to uh, if you need it, have it, how to put it on basically your systems in your labs, anywhere that's public, anywhere it's common, as well as uh, systems that you'll use. Next one. All right. So the big thing is to work with students. We want to work with students ahead of time whenever we can. And we want to work with get the get their notice. And so um, prior readings in class, usually when I have a student with a uh, visual disability, I will really receive notices from them anywhere from uh, six weeks to three weeks to one week. And sometimes the day of the class. And so just what I tend to do is I will go and make these available. I always put things up ahead of time. Um, if it's syllabi and everything, everything gets to sit ahead of time for persons. They all know ahead of time books to read. Not only do I give books, but all of my books are offered in an alternative format. I have only used books in which there is electronic copies of that the person can have screen read either through uh, the publisher or through one of these things like JAWS. Front row seating, front row seating. So, so uh, why would I, someone who's blind, be in the front row? OK, there's a lot of reason right there. Uh, right there, one, because of that is clarity. Don't have people around. Easy access, all right? But they may not. Persons may set wherever they want, but that's one of the things I always like to make sure. I'm always facing the class, all right? Even the right there, persons may go, have the vision, but they still may also use uh, vision and hearing there. And we'll um, I'll talk about that 
Uh, large audio braille copies. Again, anything I give out in class, I make sure there is accessible to it. Again, students. I make faux pas all the time. I have a disability that affects my speech. Students know that. They're going to record it. Sometimes it will show up. OK, sometimes it's a great learning experience. Um, we, but it's there. I let them do it. Talk about it there. Take notes. Anytime I'm going to do a field trip, I need to make sure that it's accessible, whether it's a virtual field trip or an in-person field trip. And I need to think about if I'm having someone coming in with me, a person who's blind, person low vision, what are they able to get from it? What are they missing? If they're going to be excluded and everything has to be descri described to them, is it really what I want to show? Is there a better way to do it or another alternative? Uh, Chicago, I loved uh, Chicago, had a wonderful art museum that I totally was uh, in love with and I uh, worked with them. And the reason I know the art museum real well is uh, I used to share a house with the president of University of Iowa and they, and he was also the basically in charge of the Chicago Art Museum. And one of the things we did was some really subtle things is that uh, not only did paintings and rooms and stuff, but we also incorporated things like other senses like lights and red. We had coolness and hotness and we actually made it this three dimensional environment, which would made it a really great place to take students to. Um, so provide equipment in your science labs. Make sure ahead of time that they are accessible. There is a lot of work and uh, we will have resources for commissions for the blind. And we have basically some links to all that about how to make your labs accessible, how to work with different things. Don't be afraid with it. If you are in basically a um, classroom and you have a person with a visual disability or there, don't move the furniture around. OK, get that orientation right there and keep it that orientation. All right. If you do move a few things, next slide, please. Okay. Basic etiquette is just kind of people don't know what to sometimes they right there. One of the things I tell people when you come up to a person who uh, has a visual impairment or blind, identify yourself. Just because they heard your voice once or twice doesn't mean they know who you are. And so talk uh, there. I always say, hi, it's David. How are you doing? Hey, it's Dr. Dawson. What, uh, all right. The other thing that I will <laughs> people forget about is to let them know when you're walking away or you're going to leave. I have watched people go and their person with visual disability and then they just kind of walk away. <laughs> the person's kind of looking, are you still there? Um, Always talk in a normal tone just because a person has a vision loss. They don't have a hearing loss. We tend to sometimes you'll see people shout or talk loudly or there. It's OK to let people know where you are. A light tap right there. I usually say, can I tap right there? Can I show right there? And let them know where I am orientation there. Um, if I'm working with someone and we're doing it, I give visual descriptions of, the, of my surroundings, of what there are all the time if I walk into someone. If someone wants to right there, I'll offer my arm. So if I'm uh, walking with them, I do have uh, students. Uh, one of my students who was blind, who was uh, just really, really good. Um, just listening, hearing that would be able to follow me. And most of the times they could follow me just so they said by my footsteps and right there at the same times I would still need to know to let them know, you know, there's a trash can here or that there's something in front of you. Um, but when they do never take someone's arm, let them take your arm. Dog, uh, working animals are working animals. They are not pets. We shouldn't ask to pet a dog. No one in class should pet a dog. A service dog is allowed in any class. Service dog is allowed to sit next to the person right there. And so always respect the service dog as the service dog. Now saying that, we had a service dog and one day um, in one of the labs we had, we had a problem where we had basically computers were all malfunctioning and doing some problems right there. 
and we took a look and the cables were really kind of torn up. So we replaced the cables. And about a week later, the cables were torn up. What we found out was her dog, when it was getting bored, was chewing on the cables while waiting for her. And so we had to then go say, you know, let's take uh, Tasha and let's move Tasha into a different direction here. So um, that was a lesson learned for all of us. Uh, ask persons, uh, again, what format? I never try to assume. What do they need? How do they need it? What works best for them? I also read everything on the screen, read everything out loud to a person unless told not to. Sure. Quick tips. Again, this is just quick tips right there, and some of them I already said. Don't make assumptions on their knees there. A person with a visual disability, there are so many different ways that um, that their vision may be impacted that it's really hard to know without asking them. Let them know. Sometimes also you need to be able to be upfront and let them know when you see some there. Some some students I have are cautious of um, right there, and I may be assuming that they're doing it and that they're able to have screen ears. Said, are you doing your screen ears? I'm fine. Are you using screen ears? And I may ask them, say, what are you using? And if they haven't, there, I had one um, student not too long ago who was on using a uh, screen reader, but they didn't like it because they the voice right there, and so they didn't use it a whole lot. And I said, have you ever changed the voices? And you all don't need to know that, but if you ever get in that problem, you can contact Student Disability Services or um, us right there. But I said, have you ever tried different voices with it? And they didn't even realize that we could set all these different voices in it and change it to so it sounded very natural, which made him then use it more. Um, again, there, orientation there, read aloud, I said, verbal descriptions right there, early syllabus, and then make sure that, again, you have things that are accessible. We're offering a number of uh, in the slides you can download. And again, there are links to accessibility guides. These are just not only for persons with visual disability. Um, it also talks about auditory learning disabilities. I always recommend faculty go through these, take a look at them. The more that you know how to do these, the more that you may be able to offer suggestions or understand when someone comes in with things. I have some persons when I'm doing Microsoft Word, um, the idea of changes and putting the comment notes. They have a difficulty with the comment notes, and so we may have different ways and we do that, how we do the uh, Microsoft Word and how we do some of the uh, editing. For one of my students, it was comment notes. For another of my students, it was literally, uh, I would change the font to a different color. And their screen reader would let know it's a different color when it knew the different color they knew that this was one in which needed corrected or something to look at and so which each person you i kind of guide and learn how to work with them okay thanks and then we offer resources different resources available to you again you don't need to be the expert student disability services is our expert okay um but we also have other resources escator we're uh, we are available to also help right there. We are working with uh, accessibility right there, but by no means take a place student disability services. Um, but also ahead, do it is a group that I've known for a very long time. And pretty well, these resources can help you. And I think we ran out of time, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Hari. <laughs> Okay. Thank you all so much for joining us today. 